How's everybody doing today? Everybody hear me? Okay. Again, uh, just a, a word of a caution if you've been missing the announcements in the previous weeks or you just happen to find yourself online or you're listening in today. Uh, I want every, every parent just kind of needs to know to use their discretion. Uh, this week and next week in particular, we're going to be talking about terms associated with sexuality as well as uh, various uh, sexual sins in our culture, and I really want to kind of have the freedom to use terms and, and address those critical issues in our culture. And so if you missed those cautions before and, and you want to take your children to their classes, we won't look. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, but again, that, that's the warning, and it's up to each parent to kind of make that decision. But that being said, I don't want parents to turn a blind eye to what their children have been, will be, or are being exposed to. Um, I would rather them hear uh, about these things from the church than uh, from the culture. And so, I mean, with the internet and our fingertips, um, we are exposed to things that were once left to CD stores, stacks of magazines. Uh, whether your kids are homeschooled or go to private Christian school or a public school, they're going to be exposed to this stuff at some point. Some people think that even just school choice means your kids are automatically protected. And um, uh, parents, you have uh, very strong opinions. I know we have very strong opinions about educational choices. But each parent needs to choose what is best for their own child. Uh, I've seen godly kids in public schools, and I've seen kids who have rejected Jesus and living in sin in private Christian schools. Uh, but at some point, again, our children are going to be and, and must be equipped to make wise choices because they're going to encounter the world's definition of sexuality at a very young age. Um, just some statistics for you. The, the first exposure to pornography among men is 12 years old and falling. Uh, 90% of teens and 96% of young adults are either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when they talk about porn with their friends. One in five searches on, on cell phones today are for pornography. And uh, this one's shocking. 71% of teens hide their online behavior from their parents. So we can't turn a blind eye. Churches need to address this, but again, it's not just uh, uh, teens that need to hear this. Adults need it as well. <laughs> and adults, we need this because probably we've never heard it from churches growing up. Uh, one of the reasons, I think, might be because it might hit too close to home. Uh, according to Covenant Eyes, one in five youth pastors and one in seven senior pastors admit to using porn on a regular basis. And that's 50,000 church leaders in our country, and those are the ones who admit it. 64% of Christian men, 15% of Christian women uh, use porn once a month. Um, I think many Christians really have no idea what the Bible teaches about sex, and so they go looking for it in other places because they've never been taught about what the Bible teaches. And there is also spiritual warfare that's happening in this area. Uh, I want to say up front that what I say today and what I say next week is addressed to Christians, okay, to, uh, followers of Christ who are, are, are called and expected to follow what Christ taught. And so if, if you're not a Christian, if you have no interest in becoming a Christian, uh, some of what I say won't make much sense to you because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Or why would you obey someone that you don't have a relationship with? In fact, much of what I say also might make you mad, if you're a Christian, you're going to have this inward desire to do what God tells you to do, right? Not what Seth tells you to do, what, what the Bible tells you to do. Um, that's why we encourage everybody to, to have a Bible, to uh, check these things out for yourselves. And if you don't have a Bible, we encourage you to just take one, all right? Take one with you. Uh, we would encourage you to, to do that. You have permission, right? <laughs> you don't have to tuck it under your coat and run. Um, <clears throat> But I also understand there are people that, that come to church and think that just because they go to a Christian church that they're a Christian. Um, just because you enter a, a church does not mean that you are a Christian. You can walk the walk. You can talk the talk. Uh, you can uh, do all the right things, say all the right things, and still have a very self-centered heart devoid of a relationship with the Lord. 
Uh, Jesus said that, in fact, in Matthew 7. He said, uh, um, again, talking about a day uh, of judgment. He said, on that day, a lot of people are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? I mean, they're even involved in spiritual warfare, casting out demons in the name of Jesus. They're doing all these mighty works in your name. And Jesus says, on that day, I will declare to them, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So all these people use the right words, doing the right things, but they still had no relationship with Jesus. And so it's so critical. uh, Before we talk about sexuality, before we talk about God's expectations for for our lives, that we have a changed heart ourselves. You know, uh, it's otherwise it's putting the carpet for the horse. You can grow up in church and have Christian parents and Christian grandparents and still not be a Christian. Every person has to have their own relationship with Jesus. Right? God doesn't have grandkids. That's it. Um, being a Christian is what Jesus meant when he uses that term, being born again. It's a new life. It's not something you can purchase. It's not something you can earn. It's receiving what God has already done for us. Out of his love, God gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to become a, a human, fully God, fully man, lived a perfect sinless life called the Lamb of God, and he died on a cross as a sacrifice, as a payment for our sins, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. And so there's nothing that, that we do in that God has done all the work. We simply receive in faith the salvation that God offers. And that means repenting and confessing Jesus alone as payment for sin. And if you've never done that, I encourage you to do that today. I'll give you an opportunity uh, in a bit. But uh, for Christians struggling with sin, especially sexual sin, uh, uh, is is part of the Christian life. Okay, that that is something that we will face, but it doesn't mean that the penalty for sin um, hasn't been paid on the cross if that is a struggle that you are currently engaged with. That's the good news of the gospel. It's the beginning of the Christian life, but it's also the means by which we live the Christian life. That there's success uh, to be found that, that, that uh, we can enjoy peace, we can enjoy healthy marriages, we can enjoy uh, sex as God intended us to enjoy sex according to his plan and his way. And it's not just the cure uh, for our own personal lives and marriages, but also the cure for our society. I think Christians, we make a mistake sometimes of of pointing fingers at all these people that have no relationship with Jesus, and we look at the behaviors, we look at all the, the, uh, the symptoms of broken hearts, and we say, fix your behavior. You broken culture, you, and we rail against culture, we rail against especially these sexual sins without without the heart being there. We we just skip over the gospel and go right to works. And so uh, the gospel is the only cure for sexual immorality, not just in our society, but in the church. And I want us to understand, again, this isn't one of those sermons where I'm like, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, okay? I don't want to be that, and that's not what Paul does. That's not what what, uh, the gospel does. Being a Christian uh, means that that we are recovering God's purpose for our lives, that, that Satan took something that God created to be wonderful and good, and he twisted it into something that, that now creeps into our lives, into our minds, into our hearts, and, and marriage, and it leads to wounds and scars and, and spiritual devastation. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, let us, in uh, Hebrews 12, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race set before us. You know, there there are Christians that are trying to run shackled with with sin and shame. Shackled. And so uh, what I want to do today, um, you know, first of all, if you're not a Christian, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, start there. All right, that's step one. But I I want to address this this sexually immoral worldview which has infected our culture and, and has now crept its way into the church to the point where it is crippling the church's witness. It's crippling who we are as a local church, and that's why we need to talk about it as part of this series on defining the church. 
We said, you know, church is not a building, it's a people. It's global and invisible in the sense where all God's children everywhere uh, who have been saved by grace through faith are part of that invisible, global, universal church. But the Bible also speaks about local churches, and Calvary Bible Church is a local church. Uh, We are united with other churches in our shared beliefs, but we're unique. We have uh, different leaders, you have a different pastor, you have a very different pastor. Um, Sorry about that. But... um, uh, you have uh, unique gifts. Uh, when, when you walked into this church assembly, you changed the church. You made it unique. Um, and, and we have specific doctrinal statements which, which point to both our shared beliefs with other churches as well as distinctives for our church. Uh, we said a few weeks ago that doctrines don't make up beliefs. That the doctrines are like creeds. They make explicit what is implicitly believed. So creeds and doctrines, they make explicit what is already implicit. They don't make it up. Um, So what has happened in the last two decades, there has been so much confusion and conflict within and without the church uh, uh, about these practices involving marriage and sexuality. And so the church, to uh, clearly define what it is that, that we believe about these things, has to have a doctrinal statement about this. And so for the sake of clarity, we, we drew up a doctrinal position on biblical marriage and sexuality. Uh, I'll just read, uh, read our statement to you. We believe that the term marriage has only one biblical meaning, a marriage sanctioned by God which joins one man and one woman in a single exclusive union as delineated in Scripture. Second, we believe that God intends sexual intimacy to, occur only, or to only occur between a man and a woman who are married to each other. We believe that God has commanded that no intimate sexual activity be engaged in outside of a marriage between a man and woman. And so we're going to cover that today. But next week, uh, we believe that any form of sexual immorality, such as adultery, fornication, homosexuality, bisexual conduct, bestiality, incest, pornography, or any attempt to change one's sex or disagreement with one's biological sex is sinful and offensive to God. All right. Right there, that's a gut check. <laughs> um, and, and that is not uh, a popular thing to read right now. And I understand that even reading that doctrinal statement might stir up some confusion or even anger uh, from, from someone that may not understand my heart in this. Um, to use a, a phrase that's used in our culture, it might even sound intolerant. Uh, and I say misunderstood because uh, people misunderstand the word intolerant as well. Uh, people think that the tolerance means that you agree or you affirm someone else's beliefs. If you don't, you are intolerant. But that's not what tolerance means. Tolerance is the ability to tolerate or endure beliefs or behaviors with someone that you disagree. Uh, so tolerance assumes disagreement. All right? If you already agree with someone, there's no need for tolerance. All right, uh, and so so my my goal again on this first of all uh, that yes there is disagreement between the sexuality that the Bible demonstrates as good and the sexuality that the world celebrates as good that there is disagreement but secondly it's un- it's so important that the church have a biblical understanding because there is such a strong connection between biblical sexuality and the gospel. It's not, it's not just a moral, behavioral, abstract issue that it gets to the core of the gospel, what we believe about marriage and about sexuality. And we're going to show you why. And, and, and I want to strengthen our, our, our testimony as a church in that regard. But third, I want to strengthen our witness. Um, I, I want our tolerance to be like Jesus' tolerance. I want us to be able to interact with people with whom we may disagree Uh, Jesus uh, did not agree with the behaviors and lifestyles of many people he interacted with, but yet he didn't condone or celebrate sin. He demonstrated grace coupled with truth and love toward the individuals that he disagreed with, so much so that that some of them who were living in sin when they were faced with the reality of the person of Jesus Christ and his standard perfection, they recognized their own sinfulness, had a change of heart, and, and they were prompted to repent. And some of them even became vessels for the gospel themselves. That, that's our heart. I mean, that's what we're about as a church. Transformed lives, transformed hearts. And so our, our primary passage that we're going to look at today is 1 Corinthians 6. And so if you have your Bibles or want to grab one out of the pews there, 1 Corinthians 6. 
Uh, Corinthians is an interesting letter. Uh, some letters are, uh, you know, celebrating and encouraging to, to these churches that are doing things well. Uh, the letters to the Corinthians, they, I mean, they're just like, you know, come on, guys, shape up. You know, let's shape up. And, and part of it is the culture of, the, of Corinth. And so the city of Corinth, it, it was a very large city. It was a, a, a central in this trade route, but it was known for its sexual immorality, Right at the center of, of Corinth, there was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, which employed thousands of prostitutes. And so these prostitutes would come down in this city, and the city would celebrate uh, sexual immorality uh, centered around prostitution and, again, uh, this temple worship. And so, you know, we think that we have a culture that worships sex. The, the Corinthians, uh, you know, they, they literally had a culture that worshiped sex. Uh, and so new believers, as, as churches are, are, are being formed, many of them are coming out of this culture. They've been steeped in that culture. And so Paul is writing this letter, and he's going to give them a biblical sexual ethic that honors God and reflects the gospel. And so, so Paul's goal is, is like my goal, not to just rail against what's wrong with the culture, but to show very clearly that God's way works. God's way is the absolute best life to be lived. Uh, as opposed to the way of the world, which is going to lead to death and destruction, God's way leads to what the, 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 the Hebrew uh, language calls shalom. Right? It's this, this peace, this joy, this fulfillment, this completeness. You know, that's God's hope and joy, uh, and, joy and, and pleasure for us, that, 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 our, that his gospel lived down in our lives would create shalom. And so with that in mind, if you're uh, able and willing, I would ask you to just stand with me in honor of God's word as I begin reading our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that, that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Let's pray. Father, I know that as, as we look to you, as we look to your word, there, there is a world of confusion out there. There is uh, hurts and anger when this comes to this subject, and many of us have experienced uh, those hurts. Um, many of us have experienced uh, guilt and fear and shame. Um, others are experiencing joy and thanksgiving for, for what you create to be a gift in their lives. And, and, and some are being asked today to make a choice of whether to follow your way or the world's way. And so I pray that you would just meet us where we're at. We ask for the filling of your spirit. I pray that you protect me from error, uh, that you would protect us all from arrogance or, or a judgmental spirit. Um, help us to keep Christ Jesus and, and the gospel at the forefront of our lives, of our speech. We want to be obedient to you. And just thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So as we, whew, you guys okay? I'm like, man, this is like, this is heavy. Um, <laughs> I, I, I told the video guys, I mean, if you could just take like the blushing out of my face and everything, we'll be okay. Um, and, uh, and, and I appreciate your prayers for me too. I mean, like, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's one of those days where, like, like everything is, you know, like, I'm, I'm amazed that I have, like, two matching shoes on the same feet, and, like, so I'm, I'm scatterbrained to begin with, and to tackle this issue again that is so sensitive, um, uh, so just 
bear with me in this. <laughs> but in this passage, there is a command that is central to everything else going on. And this central command is in verse 18. And uh, again, if you have your Bible, you might want to uh, underline or highlight. If you're taking one uh, to take home, you can still underline and highlight it. Um, but the command that to note verse 18 is flee from sexual immorality. Flee. Run. Don't, don't reason. Don't rationalize. Don't excuse it. Run from it. Flee from it. Uh, the Greek word that Paul uses for, for the, the term sexual immorality is the Greek word pornea, all right? and, and it's where we get the word porn from. Uh, but the word pornea uh, throughout Koine or common Greek, it referred to anything, uh, anything from adultery to fornication, prostitution, homosexuality, anything in between, anything, uh, any sexual activity outside of marriage was considered sexual immorality. Okay, and, and that's exactly what our doctrinal position, position states, that, that marriage is the only place where any sexual activity is expected and permitted by God. Outside of marriage, it's dangerous, it's harmful, and it requires fleeing. Okay, does that make sense? So in marriage, it's not immorality. Outside of marriage, it is immorality. Um, for example, it's been pretty cold this weekend. How many of you had a fire somewhere in your house? A fireplace, uh, a lot of people have fireplace in their house. Um, it's wonderful to have a fireplace. But if you're cold, it would be foolish of you to take some timber and create a fire in the middle of your living room. Right? It, it would be silly. I mean, it would feel great for a moment, but it leads to destruction, all right, it, it burns down the house. It destroys the family, okay? Uh, the family room in that case. But, um, uh, but, there, but God created these boundaries in which the fire is to be enjoyed. And not only that, when you create a fire in the proper place, there is warmth. There is, is blessing. There is benefit. It, it is, a, it is a, just a joy to have a fire at the right time in the right place. Right? But again, not in the right time, not in the right place, destruction. And so uh, I want to just talk about this fireplace for the moment. And we ask ourselves, like, what is marriage? Well, if you missed last week's sermon on, on recovering God's design for marriage, you go back and listen to it. But I want to go today even deeper on a, on a theological level, what is marriage? And so maybe to frame the question like this, when is a man and woman married? Right. Did you ever think about that? When is a person actually married? Is it when the pastor says, I now pronounce you man and wife, husband and wife? Um, is it when the couple signs the marriage license? Or is it when the pastor actually signs the, the marriage license? That, you know, I, I, I've always had that fear because you know, they bring the marriage license to me. I'm like, okay, we're going to sign this like, at, at the rehearsal dinner so I don't you know, get caught up in the marriage day and like, forget to sign your license. You go off your honeymoon and then you've got to, you know, I, I, I fret about those things. Um, but I, you know, when is a person married? Is, is it a human invention? Is it part of a ceremony? Um, is it just this legal arrangement, companionship? If, if so, then, I mean, who cares who gets married and when they get married? But as we saw last week, if God created marriage as a divine institution, as a divine mandate, which he does, marriage takes on this whole new meaning. And so we ask, you know, what, what is marriage in God's eyes? What, when does marriage start in God's eyes? So keep your finger here at 1 Corinthians and look back with me at Genesis 2, 24. Okay, this is pretty interesting when you, when you actually look at what this says in Genesis 2, 24. Uh, if you're not familiar with this passage, this is the very first wedding, the very first marriage. So in Genesis 2.24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And so the question is, who's speaking there? You ever think about that? At first glance, it looks like it's the man that is speaking there. I mean, when you go back, you know, verse 23, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. But does your Bible end the quote before it gets to verse 24? It, it probably does. And I know there's not punctuation in the ancient Hebrew, but what the translators are doing, they're telling us something that it's not the man who is speaking. Well, who's speaking? Is it 
Uh, is it uh, just a generic narrator? Well, Jesus actually answers that question for us in Matthew 19. So Matthew 19, you can leave Genesis uh, and go to Matthew 19. So Jesus is answering a question uh, from the Pharisees about divorce. They're trying to trap Jesus about divorce. And so they ask him, you know, is it lawful to divorce your wife for any reason, right? Or, you know, why? why? And, 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 and Jesus says, hey, you're mistaken. And he says in verse 4, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So who created them and made them male and female? God. And So he who created them from the beginning made the male and female and said, and then he quotes this verse, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So who's the one speaking? God is the one who makes the proclamation the two shall become one flesh. A man leaves his father and mother and holds fast to his wife. And again, that doesn't have to be a physical leaving. Um, In fact, in the Israelite marriage, uh, it would be centered around a, a uh, the, 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 the man's home. And so oftentimes the man would continue to live in or near his parents' home and the wife would be the one to leave her home and join the husband. Uh, so uh, not necessarily physical, geographical leaving, but a, a separation that is necessary for a new family to begin. There's new priorities. There's new obligations that once were shared between father and son now is to that son and to his new wife, his spouse. And so then they become one flesh. The two becoming one flesh, that's the physical act of sexual intercourse. All right? It is the, the one flesh bonding of man and woman in marriage. And we've lost that meaning. You know, today, sex is just something that married couples might do. But, you know, really anybody can do it, whether they're married or not. So who cares if you're married or not? Uh, in, in fact, if you waited... All right, I'm, I'm not pointing fingers here, but if you waited until after a ceremony or signing a piece of paper until you had sex, you're in the vast minority of all people. All right? According to a 20, uh, 2007 study by uh, Lawrence Feiner uh, of the Guttemacher Institute, um, he said 97% of people who have experienced sex first experienced sex before they were married. 97%. Uh, now, people still think marriage is important, uh, if, 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 especially if, if two people agree to spend the rest of their lives together, uh, but the normal progression is sex, cohabitation, and then legal marriage. Right? That, that's the normal progression. Two out of three couples in the U.S. say they live together before marriage. Right? And so we've made sex completely separate from marriage. But in God's eyes, and this is the hard thing, all right, so bear with me. In God's eyes, sex begins marriage. I, I want to just give you quick examples. I know this is like, whew, okay. And, and part of it, I want to recover what God believes, but I don't want to just cheapen it. I want to elevate it to the point where, like, this is what God thinks sex is, is the joining of a, of a husband and wife in marriage. It's the, the institution of marriage. Um, so quick examples. Uh, Isaac and, and Rebecca, Genesis 24, 67. You don't have to turn there if you want, uh, uh, but uh, it says, Isaac brought her, Rebecca, into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebecca, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So no ceremony, all right? They go into the tent, and she becomes his wife, all right? Pretty simple. For Isaac's son Jacob, though, things get pretty messy, if you remember. Uh, there, there is a ceremony. There is these legal agreements that get involved. So ge- turn to Genesis 29. If you think you had a messed up family, uh, read, the, read the Old Testament. Genesis 29. So Laban, now verse 16, Genesis 20 and 16, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. So pretty clear. 
And so Laban says, well, it's better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. You know, oh, thanks, future father-in-law. Stay with me. So, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because the love he had for her. What a love story. Isn't that great? Um, so he, there is this betrothal that is happening. So Jacob is kind of betrothed to Rachel for seven years while he works for her father Laban. And, and during this time, though, Jacob and Rachel are not considered married. Yet there's an understanding that, that she was to be considered Jacob's wife because Jacob understands that. I'm not married to her, but she's my wife. There's this legal arrangement, but I'm not yet married. And so verse 21, Jacob says to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. Right? At the end of seven years, he says, hey, we got to consummate this thing. And, 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 and he does that. He makes this request before there's a ceremony, before there's um, any sort of celebration, before there's a party. He demands, I want this consummation to take place of my marriage to Rachel. But Laban, what does he do? He postpones the consummation. He says, let's have a party first. And so verse 22, Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. I might explain why what happened next could happen. Uh, in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. All right, Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. All right, thanks for telling me. Uh, complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, the consummation, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. And so, again, um, there's a lot going on there, but that kind of helps to understand how Israelites understood uh, betrothal, all right, to be promised to somebody, the, the, the legal aspects of marriage, and also the consummation of a marriage, and that gets very important when we get into Joseph and Mary, all right? Because the betrothal relationship, that's identical to legal, legal expectations, but without the sex. It's, it's usually a time period, normally about 12 months, um, uh, but they have not consummated the marriage during that time. In fact, so Matthew 1, let's look at the birth of Jesus. This becomes important, Matthew 1. The birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, verse 18. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, what does that mean? Before they had sex, all right, before they consummated the marriage, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Okay, very clear. So even though there's a betrothal, even though there's this legal expectation of that they're going to be husband and wife, uh, they did not consummate the marriage. And her husband Joseph, being, just, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Again, there's even a divorce for this legal expectation of this betrothal. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, and very specifically here it says, but knew her not until she had given birth to his son, and he called his name Jesus. And so the reason why Matthew is so specific there is because to an, a Jewish audience, if you take someone as your wife, it implies consummation. And it implies the, the, the sexual act. And so Matthew is very careful. Twice he explains that Joseph did not consummate his marriage to Mary when taking her as his wife. All right? And again, this might surprise some people that, that might have uh, grown up Catholic, but Mary was not a perpetual virgin. They, they just did not have sex until Mary had given birth to Jesus. And then you read, you know, Matthew 13, 55, Mark 3, 31, Mark 6, 3, you discover Mary and Joseph went on to have multiple children. Um, now turn back to 1 Corinthians 6. 
And we see that Paul used the same terminology found in Genesis 2.24. One flesh is sexual union. All right, so Corinth, this place, uh, the, the prostitution, hey, it doesn't matter, just do what feels good, you know, this, this is great. And Paul says, no. Verse 16, he says, sexual intercourse, even with the prostitute, creates a new union. Verse 16, do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Now, uh, verse 18, he goes on to say that sexual immorality is a sin outside of one's body, or, or, or sin against one's body while uh, other sins are outside the body. And so, so Paul is specifically dialing in on, on sexual immorality as being a fence greater than drunkenness, than gluttony, which we would say, well, that's also taking something to the body. Like, why is Paul making such a big deal out of sexual immorality? And the reason why I think that Paul is emphasizing that not just that there's bigger consequences, as some commentators say, um, but Paul is drawing a connection between the gospel and sex. Very precise here. He says, because the body is united with the Lord, that this one sin that, that profoundly affects the body, which is now a part of Christ, destined to be resurrected, is a tearing of it away from the body of Christ, the joining of it to a prostitute. And so Paul says, hey, that's incompatible. It shouldn't be. He's not saying, you know, sex is contrary to the gospel. I mean, chapter 7 goes on to say that's not the case, that you, if you are a believer without the gift of singleness, then, then marriage is, is, is expected for you. Sex is not contrary to Christianity. It is the illustration of unity. So Paul says the body is for the Lord, verse 13. It's also for the glorifying of God in your body, verse 19. And it's compatible with a man and woman being one flesh, in verse 16. So sex creates oneness. That's the way God designed it. And so it's not inconsequential. It's not inconsequential. Uh, and Paul uses this body language. All right, here uh, he does the same thing in Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 6, to, to describe you know, that, that, that sex matters to God. It matters to God. And what our culture has done is we've minimized the theological implications. Right, of, and, and we've adopted a view of marriage as just this, this consensual relationship. And, and that goes against what God says. Uh, you know, and, and again, if, if you have that view of marriage, then you know, civil marriage, all these uh, marriages that don't require a one flesh sex union would be appropriate. But, and, and, but when ministers say, I now pronounce you husband and wife, you know, that's part of that legal agreement. You know, that, that we're, that, but behind that veil, right, uh, behind the tuxedo, is probably, you know, according to the statistics I read earlier, a couple that have been sleeping together for quite some time. Right? And, and here's what I want us to see. Uh, you know, if that couple has had sex, if, you know, if, in almost every sense of the word, socially, physically, theologically, emotionally, they're married. That sex to God is union. It's, it's marriage. Right? There's something theologically special about it. Um, and so when we have that understanding uh, of sex as a one flesh oneness between man and woman, um, it, its significance increases. Like for one, like if you have that understanding as a teenager, like that is going to make you a lot choosier <laughs> with, with, uh, with you know, who you get into the car with. Um, it's also going to um, increase our joy in marriage and the specialness of marriage, the marriage bed. Right, to say, well, it's not the pastor that pronounces a couple man and wife in God's eyes. God initiates a marriage when he makes them one flesh. And when we go against God's design, we're cheating him of his glory and the good that God intends for us. Uh, verse 14, Paul brings up uh, the resurrection. God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? God's invested in our body, created them for his glory and, and for our good not just for the present, but for eternity. So why would we use our body for something contrary to God's design? Now, 
some of your minds are just going tick, 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 and you're thinking about all these like what ifs. Okay, well, what if somebody is raped? All right, does that mean that they're married? Well, you know, rape is not part of God's, you know, plan for, you know, it, it's not part of his moral plan for your lives. Right? And, and so it, it's a tragedy, and, and actually Old Testament law does deal with some of these things, and there is a, a significance uh, to that. Uh, what about divorce and remarriage? Well, having this view actually makes a biblical understanding of divorce and remarriage make a whole lot of sense, right? That, that divorce, right, and it's just as prevalent among Christians as non-Christians, um, Christians need to be taught that divorce is not God's plan or design for marriage, all right? And we need to know his feelings. So back to Matthew 19. Again, the, 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 the Pharisees are saying, Hey, what about divorce for any reason? And Jesus says, no. All right, that's not God's intention. That, that it's only because of hardness of heart all right, that, that it happens. All right, but from the beginning, it's not so that God designed marriage to be, be between one man, one woman, their consummation joining them as one flesh, and it's intended to be a permanent, not broken. All right, what, what God joins together, let not man separate. Uh, we should have a, a God's view of divorce. It should not be part of our plan. And what we do, because we're good Americans and we like uh, uh, revolution, is uh, we try to formulate when is it okay to rebel? Right? When, when is it okay to have, when is divorce legitimate? When is, and we do what the Pharisees did. But Jesus says, no, have the mind of Christ. Don't try to determine when is divorce okay but have the mind of God and say that marriage should be unbreakable unless it's broken by your spouse. Unbreakable unless broken. All right. So the Pharisees, they're pointing the letter of the law. Jesus points the spirit of the law, unbreakable unless broken, the bond of marriage. And again, why does Jesus say, well, ad unless for adultery? Because what does adultery do? It creates a union. And it also breaks a union. So why does divorce exist? Well, it's not created by God as a license for wicked people to sin. It's created for the protection for the innocent partner making remarriage possible. Right? That's why divorce exists. Because we break God's heart. We break his law. And so the, the primary reason why Paul tells us flee sexual immorality, it's given right out of the command. Every other sin outside the body, sexual immoral person sins against his own body. It, it dishonors God when we break his plan. Right, it can dominate us. Sexual sin can dominate us. It can control us. I speak with people all the time that are dealing with addictions. And I think the scientific world is just waking up to this fact. I mean, they're doing brain scans now that are showing that, that the effects of pornography look pretty much like the effects of heroin on the brain. Uh, it, it, and it's not just the, the damage that it causes, but, but the good that doing it God's way is for us. The best sex, the longest lasting marriages are the ones where the, they've kept the fire in the fireplace. Everything else is devastating. It, it shattered more marriages, it shattered families, it caused more disease, more emotional turmoil than any other addiction or sin combined. And it devastates Christ. So turn from it, flee. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Teens, decide right now, before you're in a compromising situation, who's more important? What's more important, a moment of pleasure or the God of the universe? What's more important? God created our bodies. He knows what's best for you. Parents, start immunizing your children against what they're going to face. Teach them about the good that God has. Um, um, you know, one of the resources that I, I recommend is a, a book by uh, Kristen Jensen, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, for young kids. So you don't have to have the talk with them uh, before you start warning them about the dangers of pornography. Um, uh, we want our children to have the best possible marriages for the glory of God and for their own good. Um, but also, you know, and, and let me just say this in close, that some of us have messed up. Some of us have messed up, and I want to tell you that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You're a new creation. Today is a new day. 
You might have scars in your past uh, from past sexual immorality, and they might follow you the rest of your life. Uh, It might take a bit more work. It might take a bit more intentional effort, but you can have a wonderful, fulfilling, God-honoring marriage that glorifies Jesus Christ. Um, So I want to give hope with that. Again, we want to just walk with you and help you to see that. Um, And sometimes the hurts that we've experienced can be blessings for other people as we help others avoid what we have experienced. And if you're currently sinning in this area, Stop. <laughs> Repent. You know, it, you know, sin doesn't send a person to hell. Unrepentant sin does. If you're a follower of Christ, you've repented, you're automatically forgiven, you can never be unsaved, but if you are living in unrepentant sin, you're living apart from God. And uh, just as I said I would do so, if that's you and you want to get right with God, I'm going to close in prayer. And... Uh, I'm going to give you that opportunity. Father God, we we thank you, Lord, uh, for your good gifts. Uh, We thank you, most importantly, for the the good gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for the the gift of of, of sexuality and, uh, Lord, for creating marriages. And, and Lord, uh, we thank you for the marriages that are represented here in this room. And, Lord, we know that, that... None of them are perfect because none of us are perfect. We are all being sanctified. We are all uh, still struggling in that war between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, That There are times when we don't yield to your power and your control in our lives and we want to just ask for your forgiveness and help that you would fill us with your spirit and strengthen our marriages. And Father, I pray for somebody that that might be listening here that um, has been... Uh, feeling your call upon their lives, and they know, Lord, that, uh, that this sin that has been harbored in their life is, is displeasing to you. And maybe it's an indication that they have never begun a relationship with you. That right now, from the, their heart, that they would cry out to you, Lord, I've sinned, and I'm sorry. I want to turn from my sin and turn to you, Jesus, as my Savior and Lord. I believe that Jesus died on the cross as payment for my sin and he rose from the dead. And so I ask you, Jesus, to be my king, my savior. Fill me with your spirit and help me to live the life that, God, you want from me. We ask this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Uh, I'm going to stick around afterwards. If you would like to just talk about some of these things that I've brought up or, or want some prayer, I'm going to be up here. Um, thank you for your time. Drive safely. We'll see you next week. God bless you.